So we just pray, God, that, Lord, you would have your way, Father. And, God, even in the brief video, God, people might have tensed up and clammed up a little bit. But I want to pray, God, that, Lord, you would teach us today. I want to pray, God, you would relax us today. I want to pray, God, that, Lord, we can be, do, and become all you call us to do, be, and become. God, in the midst of this series, God, we're hitting some current issues, God. Issues where, God, Lord, we may automatically assume we know the answer, Lord. But, God, so often, God, we're, God, we are controlled emotionally. We are controlled socially. We are controlled politically, God. But I want to pray, God, that, Lord, we can, we can live biblically, Father. I want to pray, God, that, Lord, we don't automatically assume, God, we have it. But, God, we go to your word and we trust your spirit, God, to live out the right thing. It's in Jesus' name, pray and ask it all. Amen. 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 All righty. Well, as you all can see, our topic for today is um, I know right about divorce. Hello. Now, I want to say about the front, boy, anybody who's been divorced, we're not trying to pick on you. We're not trying to hate on you or anything like that. Amen. And so, boy, we are a grace-oriented, Christ-centered church, and stuff happens in life. So we're not trying to criticize, ridicule, or dog out anybody. But during this COVID period, there's been a surge in divorce in our country. And I guess what happened was after people had to live together all day long, they said, you know what? This ain't really what I signed up for right here, all right? You know, I know you really like this. And so during this period of COVID, there really has been an uptick in divorce. In our country right now, um, there are two major periods where people are pretty much go through divorce. It's the, it's the third year and it's the seventh or eighth year in your marriage relationship. Then the next big major tick comes around year 18. And so I'm not sure why that happens or anything like that, but I do know it does happen. So the question becomes, why are there so many divorces in our country? More importantly, why are there so many divorces in our church? Amen? And so if we are the, amen? amen. Uh, all right. If we are the people of God, we've got the word of God, we've got the people of God, we've got the spirit of God, we've got the word of God, then why do we encounter just as many divorces as those who are without God's word, without God's people, and without God's spirit? Hello? Y'all can't say amen to that. Okay, okay, cool, cool. It's going to be a rough day, Reverend. And so anyway, watch this now. Smile at me. And so many of you all right now, um, you all see what's happening in our country. You all see what's happening with marriage. You say, well, say, say, well, 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 Pastor, what difference does it really make that you are a believer in Jesus Christ? Many of you all are single. I say, well, 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 Pastor, I'm single, and this doesn't really pertain to me. I want to suggest you check out why people get divorced before you get married. Smile at me, all right? I, I know what you're saying. Well, Pat, that ain't going to happen to me. I'm going to be different. Yeah, everybody says that until they get married, all right? Smile at me. I mean, I was the perfect husband, and then I got married. And smile at me, all right? Watch this now. So many of you all right now, you're in a marriage relationship, and you may be angry. You may be bitter. You may be confused. You may be disgusted. You may be exhausted. You may be frustrated. You may have been gaslighted. You may be hurt. You may be injured. You may be knocked down and kicked down. You may be lamenting the fact you got married. You may just be downright mad right now. And the question becomes, is it going to be a red light? a yellow light or a green light in your relationship? Are you going to choose to call it quits and stop the relationship? Are you going to put it on pause and pray right now? Or are you going to move forward in the relationship? And the question becomes, biblically, is it going to be a red light, a yellow light, or a green light? Now, anybody who's been married for any length of time, you've contemplated, should it be a red light? Should it be, okay, y'all ain't going to smile tonight. Why don't y'all at least be honest? <laughs> all right, smile at me, all right. At some point in time, you may have thought about, you know what? Is this the right thing for me to be? Is the right place for me to be? Is this the right person? Am I the wrong person? Does God have something different for me? And the reality is, how in the world do you answer those questions biblically? So I started asking that question um, um, socially or, or, or emotionally or, or financially. Let's answer the question biblically. Amen? So I want to do a lot of teaching on today. And I want to start with the, with the exceptions for divorce. Because some of y'all say, well, pastor, the Bible don't say you got to stay married. And, and boy, what about my situation? But hold on, slow down. In Matthew chapter 19, this question comes up. In fact, 
it comes up in, a, in a chapter 5 of Matthew, and also in chapter 19, the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is really talking about God's kingdom agenda, what is God's kingdom plan, and how do we function according to God's kingdom agenda and God's kingdom plan. And in Matthew 19, they, they have these questions about divorce. And it says here in verse um, chapter 19, starting at verse 1, now, when Jesus had finished these saints, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him. So but the Pharisees were always trying to trip up Jesus and test Jesus. Is it lawful to, to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, watch this now, here's the exception, except for, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Y'all still with me? I mean, all I did was just read the scripture. Y'all can at least say amen. I mean, I just, I mean, all I did was just read the book, all right? He smiled at me. And so, but the first exception when it comes to this idea of being married, the first exception is, he says here, he says in verse 9, um, except for sexual immorality. The second exception comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You guys still with me? Uh, Romans, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15 says this. It says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So the first one is for, is for, is for, is for adultery. And the second one is for abandonment. And so if an unbelieving spouse says, you know what? I'm leaving you. I'm out. I'm gone. I don't want to be here anymore. God says, watch this now. If you're a believer and your unbelieving spouse leaves, then that may be God calling you to peace. And some of y'all say, I knew he wasn't a believer. <laughs> I knew she was done, but I'm out. No, watch this now. It didn't say you can leave. It says if they decide to leave. Are we tracking together? Because early on, it says here, it says, you know, watch this now. Because you've been in the household, you may have a sanctifying effect as a believer in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. To the rest I say, and not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a, see, but y'all got quiet on me. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Y'all say, dang. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? And so God says, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you ought to have a sanctifying effect in your marriage relationship. And therefore, you ought to be able to bring um, um, the presence of God to bear upon your household. Exception number one um, for, for, for divorce is adultery. Exception number two is abandonment. Watch this now. What is the purpose of marriage? See, so often we're trying to divorce from marriage, but we don't have a full, clear picture about the purpose of marriage. And so what is the purpose of marriage? I want to give you five purposes real quick. Number one is procreation. Genesis 1, 28. Be fruitful and multiply. Number two is protection. First, um, in, um, first, um, chapter 7, there ought to be a level of protection that comes based upon your union. 
Number three is projection. I'll read that when Ephesians chapter 5. This is a purpose and a reason that's often overlooked when it comes to, to Christian marriage and biblical marriage. We don't talk about this one. But in Ephesians chapter 5, at verse 18, he says, be filled with the Spirit. In verse 21, he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That word submitting there, it means to rank in order. It means to, it means to fulfill your spot. To, it means to carry out your role. It means to get in position. But then in verse 22 through chapter 6, verse 9, he gives us three illustrations of what this submission looks like. Where he comes to the husband and wife relationship, he starts at verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You keep saying this thing, this one flesh union. Part of our marriage relationship is supposed to be about a one flesh union. Not 50-50, not 60-40, not 70-30. It's supposed to be a one flesh relationship. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. What is this mystery? This mystery is that the husband-wife relationship is supposed to give an illustration of how God loves the church. Are we tracking together? And so why does Satan attack marriage so hard? Satan attacks marriage so hard because Satan knows the implication for marriage and that now marriage is an illustration of how Christ loves the church says he attacks marriage so people don't understand clearly how God loves his church. Number four is companionship. Amos 3, 3 says, how can two walk together except they are green? Number five is enjoyment. Hebrews 13, 4 says, let the marriage bed be undefiled. He said, but marriage is honorable in the sight of God and let the marriage bed be undefiled. So before we talk about divorce, let's talk about the purpose of marriage. Watch this now. So often we live in relationship in marriages, and we don't really understand what marriage is all about. We think it's just about, you know, having a good time, sharing bills, having sex. Ain't nothing wrong with that now. All right, smile at you already. But it's so much more than just that, amen? And so, so often we go into a marriage relationship with unrealistic, unbiblical, non-Christ-centered expectations, and then we wonder why we struggle so hard. Because so often there's not, there's not, there's not a leveling of purpose. There's not a, a, a mutuality in understanding what the marriage relationship should be about. And so we have, we have two people functioning with two different visions. And when two folks come together with two different visions, what you have is division. So in our culture, our society, what are some reasons for divorce? Depending upon who you read and, and boy, what their stats are and what they've done, there are a number and a variety of different reasons people face divorce. Number one, conflict, arguing, irretrievable breakdown in the relationship, lack of commitment, infidelity, extramarital affairs, distance in the relationship, lack of physical intimacy, communication problems between partners, domestic violence, verbal, physical, or emotional abuse by a partner, realization that one spouse has different morals and values. You know, most of the time folks get married, oh, he cute, oh, he cute. But, but what are the values? What's the substance? What's the competency? What is their commitment? Number 10, one partner not caring, they're waiting to marriage. Don't say amen. One part of not caring that way in the marriage. Watch now, financial problems, debt, marrying too young, lack of shared interest, incompatibility between partners. Guys, let me tell you something. Couples who get married and decide to get divorced face the same issues as couples who decide to stay married and don't get divorced. Ain't like it's a separate set of issues that 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 that, that happily married folks um, face and folks who get divorced face and folks who get and folks who stay married. Guys, we all face the same issues. The question becomes, how in the world do you manage the issues? Are we tracking together? 
And so the question becomes, when you get married, what is the purpose of marriage? Are you functioning based upon an exception? Before you say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm going to stop the relationship. I'm going to stop praying. I'm going to go ahead. Watch now. The question becomes, what does God's word say about it? Are we tracking together? And so most folks say, well, well, you know what? God wants me to be happy, and boy, I ain't happy. So but since I ain't happy, God must be giving me a green light to leave the relationship. I'm asking a question, where is that in the good word, those who are online right now? Are we tracking together? And so but the reality is, boy, you have to leave life to be happy all the time. You don't just exit life because, so boy, you can't just leave marriage because you're not happy. Amen. So watch this now, watch this now. Why, why, why do so many Christians get divorced? I think one of the reasons is Matthew 19, verse 8. It's hardness of heart. Yeah, boy, you get married, boy, your heart is just fluffy, your heart is just excited, boy, your heart is just fluttering, your heart is, is just excited, and boy, then you start doing life together, and boy, that hardens your heart a little bit. You get your feelings hurt. Okay, my heart's a little bit harder now. Blow up. Okay, boy, heart's a little harder now. Betrayal. The heart's a little bit harder now. Don't want to go visit my family. It's really hard now. Smile at me. And boy, the heart just becomes harder and harder and harder and harder. And then, what, boy, what used to be an open, fluffy, loving, um, 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 wonderful heart is now a hardened heart. And then, boy, it's easier with a heart. I say, you know what? I'm going to stop this thing. I don't want to be in here no more. So watch this now. What's another reason? I think another reason is that, boy, we don't know how to navigate trouble. We don't know how to navigate trouble. You know what? In our culture, in our society, there's no negotiation. There's no, boy, let's work together and collaborate. Let's try figuring this thing out. No, if somebody disagrees with you, then, boy, it must be a problem. But we can't get along and we can't go along. We must go our separate ways. I want to suggest just because you are um, 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 disagree does not mean you have to divide. Watch this now. The question is not merely um, 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 how, you, how you're functioning emotionally, how you're functioning socially. Wait a minute. Am I functioning biblically? Just because you're divided does not mean you have to split. And so in our world in premarital counseling, we do, oh, oh, watch now. Number one, we typically don't do premarital counseling. You got to go through driver's ed to get a driver's license. But you ain't got to go through marriage yet to get a marriage license. And so people like end up being ill-prepared when it comes to marriage. They don't understand the purpose of marriage. They don't understand the problems of marriage. They don't understand the process of marriage. And so watch this now. When a child if somebody makes you mad, somebody makes you upset, then you just divide, you just leave, you just quit fooling with them. Hello? So we live in a culture where we have not learned to navigate suffering, how to navigate challenges, how to navigate problems, how to navigate differences, how to navigate suffering. So when the things go bad and things go down, we say, I'm going to shoot you the deuces. I'm out of here. I'm done with you. And watch this now. We're now being controlled by our flesh. We're now being controlled by our emotions. And we're not being controlled by the word of God. Are we tracking together? Well, Pastor, what's the third reason we just rushed toward divorce? I want to say lack of humility. It's your fault. God, the woman you gave me. God, that chick in the other room right now. God, that dude who don't want to work right now. God, that person I can't stand. And but we keep pointing the finger and pointing the finger and pointing the finger and pointing the finger. And what do they always say? When you point one finger, you got four pointing back at you. That really ain't true because it's really kind of when you point one, but uh, the thumb going forward and that finger going forward, so it's really just three fingers. So, but, so but, I mean, it's just a messed up illustration, right? It really ain't four. The thumb ain't coming back at you, right? Uh, unless you point like that, right? So anyway, anyway, what, 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 watch now. Matthew, Matthew 7 says what? It says, judge not lest you be judged. 
But then it goes on and says, you know what? The real thing is, boy, have you first examined yourself before you try examining somebody else? How many times in divorce court people say, you know what? You know what? I messed up a whole lot too. And they messed up, but I want a divorce. Now, they ain't go. No, typically, they messed up. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. They didn't. And, but we go pay somebody else to document that. They messed up. I'm good. I didn't have a problem. And God said, you know what? Why don't we have humility? You know what? I've contributed to what's transpiring in this relationship as well. Like Rob Bay said, it takes two to make everything go. <laughs> <laughs> so boy here's the real question the real question is, is well watch this now before you go red light yellow light or green light the real question becomes how in the world do we extinguish divorce nobody in their right mind gets married to get divorced Guys, I, I know it's a tough topic. I know you want to just tune me out and turn me off. But guys, we ought to be distinct and we ought to be different as believers in Jesus Christ. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got Jesus Christ who's written from the grave. And boy, after all, he knows everything we have, have, um, um, have gone through and that we're going through, as Hebrews said, but yet he's perfect without sin. Are we tracking together? So watch this, guys. Guys, how do we navigate this stuff? How do we extinguish divorce? Do we to navigate heartbreak? Do we have a strategy to navigate a knucklehead? Do we have a strategy to navigate the pain? Do we have a strategy to navigate anger? Do we have a strategy to overcome bitterness? Do we have a strategy to clarify confusion? Do we have a strategy to um, rise up from disappointment? Are we tracking together? And so, boy, how do we extinguish this? So I started to give you 10 tips for the tipping point of divorce. But I came up with 12 things. Smile at me. I'm going to go through them real quick, all righty? Number one, guys, guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. In the Hebrew, the heart just didn't mean that thing that's beating right there. It means the center of your emotions. It means your mind. Guys, guard your mind. What's going into your mind? What's been implanted at the seat of your emotions when it comes to, to the person you're seeing? But some of y'all say, I'm sleeping with the enemy. My they couldn't be, I'm, I'm just sleeping with them, all right? God says, guard your heart, guard your mind, guard sleep your mind. Number two is, boy, soften your hardened heart. Let me ask you a question. How many of you all are functioning in your marriage with a hardened heart? You cook and you contemplate cyanide every time. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got dinner, no problem. I'll have dinner over there in just a few minutes and... Um, you know, um, how would you, you, you need some hot sauce on it. I mean, you know, all righty, watch this now. Soften your hardened heart. But, but what's that? Nobody tells us how to soften a hardened heart. Why, 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 watch guys. Things may make your heart hardened, but worshiping God, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God can soften a hardened heart. And so when your heart is continually hardened for a long period of time, it's not an indictment against the person you live with. It's an indictment that you're not in with God. Now, I'm not saying that, boy, they ain't a knucklehead. I'm not saying that, boy, they ain't crazy. I'm not saying that, boy, you got to say one But I am saying that, boy, the condition of your heart is predicated upon the condition of you worshiping God, spending time with God, praying before God. It's not predicated upon your circumstances. But we live in a world where people say, well, my disposition has to be dictated by what's happening around me. Guys, that's not just in marriage. That's in all of life. And we ought to be insulated from that as believers in Christ. We ought to function based upon what God says, based upon the Holy Spirit, not based upon our circumstances. Number three, if we're going to extinguish divorce, you've got to learn to suffer well. I know y'all don't want to hear this shit, Pastor. You know what, Pastor? Pastor, you're bringing the wrong thing. But guys, I'm not here for a TED talk. I'm here for a God talk.
I know everything got to be tweeted that's good. You know, boy, it's got to be comfortable. It's got to be great. I got to be right. But God, that's just not God. That's just not Christ. That's just not Christianity. Christianity says that if you suffer with him, you'll also reign with him. Hello. And I don't know about y'all. I don't like suffering. Hello. Anybody? Can I get a witness? All righty. I don't like suffering. I don't like pain. I don't like discomfort. I don't like disadvantage. I don't like being on the bottom. I don't like that. But that's why you have God's grace. That's why God says in the Old Testament, he's a refuge. That's why God says he's a very present help in a time of trouble. Because God knows that sometimes life gets uncomfortable. But the book of James tells us sometimes life gets uncomfortable because God wants to squeeze the mess out of us and bring the best out of us. When we suffer with him, we also reign with him. Number four, hello, y'all good? Can I get an amen before I say this? Because after I said, I might not get an amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So I got now. I'm still keeping up with my amen count. All right. The sisters ain't gonna like this one, but the brothers gonna love it. Um, stay sexually active with your spouse. <laughs> I'll get a tip for that one, right? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that when you get mad at your mate? You're sleeping in the bed with them. You live in the same house with them. You drive the same car with them. You continue to um, um, sh um, share the same kids with them. You even watch TV with them. But when it comes, I ain't having sex with you. Mm -mm. I know that one. Why? Because you know what? Because the devil knows how important sex is for unity in a relationship. Now, I know y'all saying, well, see, see, that's what he just a man. And boy, he thinks sex going to solve all right. No, it ain't going to solve it, but it'll help. <laughs> Church gonna be full of brothers next week, all right, guys. I'm doing part two next week, guys. All right, <laughs> watch this now. Let me turn next. I know, I said, well, boy, where's that at in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? Watch now. First Corinthians seven. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, what's interesting here is that in First Corinthians chapters one through six. Um, um, Paul is ad um, addressing things for the church at Corinth. In chapter seven, he begins to answer the questions they had sent to him. So in the midst of this Q&A, one of the first questions that Paul addresses from the church at Corinth is their sex life. Isn't that interesting? He just a man too, ain't he? Smile at me. Now, concerning the matters about what you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relationship with a, with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. Brothers, when you go home and say, baby, I just came to give you your conjugal. <laughs> the Bible say give you your conjugal. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to be right with God, baby. All righty. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Ain't no woman laugh at that last joke, did they? All right. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the woman doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Guys, this is not talking about forced sexual interaction. Let me say that, okay? We got warped minds. And boy, the Bible is not talking about abuse and, and taking advantage of somebody and, and forcing yourself. It's, you know what? We're going to mutually agree that this would not be a battleground for us, that we're going to enjoy this. We're going to participate. We're going to cooperate because even in our intimacy, God's got a reason behind our intimacy. Verse 5. Do not deprive one another except perhaps agreement for a limit say say limited. limited not limitless God said I ain't got to give it to you when I'm praying well, baby, you ain't praying <laughs> well, let me. watch now that you may devote yourselves to prayer but then come together again why so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self control how do we extinguish divorce guard your heart number two soften your heart and um, soften your heart. Now, number three, suffer well. Number four, stay sexually active with your spouse. Number four, remember the reason for your relationship. Ephesians 5, we want to be a projection of Christ's love for the church. Number six, forgive for goodness sake. Forgive for, good, 
for goodness sake. Watch this now. Forgiveness does not mean they didn't do it. Forgiveness does not mean they were not wrong. Forgiveness does not mean there will not be consequences. Forgiveness simply means I'm going to unleash you to God. Smile at me. See, guys, God always holds people accountable. But we often don't want to forgive because we believe the person does not deserve to be forgiven. But don't forget, guys, God is watching. God is aware. Everybody, believer and non-believer, their accountability is, is, is brought back to God. And God is able to administer his justice however he deems appropriate. Are we tracking together? So watch this now. They may get away from you. They won't get away from God. But let me give you another reason. Watch this now. Matthew 6. You all know that the Lord's prayer is really the Lord teaching his disciples how to pray. It comes to 6, 6 verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you all want to be forgiven by the Father? Okay, I only saw one or two hands. How many of you all want to be forgiven by the Father? Okay, that ain't no trick question. This is real good, right? Watch this now. How many of you all have sinned against God and need God's forgiveness? Out there in virtual world, how many of you all, raise your hand to the house, you're kidding me, well, well, watch right now, because just, just tell them you're a sinner, all right? How many of you all need, for, smile at me, how many of you need forgiveness from God? And if we're in need of forgiveness from God, God expects us to extend forgiveness to other people. You say, well, pastor, if they did wrong, they don't deserve forgiveness. The issue of them doing wrong, not the issue of forgiveness. The question becomes, has God forgiven you for what you have done? Are we tracking together? Watch this now, verse 15. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Hold on now. So God, you're trying to tell me, and boy, he don't nuance it. He don't qualify it. He just says that if you don't forgive others their trespasses, if you don't forgive on the, on the horizontal level, God will not forgive you on a vertical level. So I wonder how many of us are walking around unforgiving. My mind, there's guilt, shame, there's frustration, there's bitterness, there's anger. Doors, opportunities seem to be closed. Maybe you're walking around unforgiven. You say, well, 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 I didn't do anything that bad. But God is saying, you know what? When you didn't forgive your fellow brother or sister, when you don't forgive your maid, I'm not going to forgive you for what you do. Turn to Ephesians real quick. You guys good? How do we navigate trouble? How do we, how do we, how do we extinguish? How do we get a fire, a fire hydrogen boy? How do we put out the fires of divorce? Ephesians chapter four, you guys there? And so if you, I'm, 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 chapter four starting at verse um, 29. Let no corrupt talking come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up. Isn't it amazing how when you get angry with your mate, that boy, what you say to them is not productive. It's hurtful. It's ungodly. It's destructive. He says here, but only such is good for building up as is fit for the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. When you get angry with your spouse, is your communication gracious? Watch this now, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. See, boy, we think about grieving the Holy Spirit. We think about robbing a store. We think about shooting somebody. We thinking about, you know, murder. Because you know what? When you speak ungodly words, unsavory words about your mate, to your mate, to other people, you are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. He says here, um, by whom you were sealed by the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. What's the standard for forgiveness? As God in Christ forgave you. See, that's the last thing I want to do, I get angry. The last thing I want to do is be tenderhearted. We're talking about being hard-hearted. Last thing I want to do is be kind. 
last thing I want to do is be forgiven and let them loose. God says, you know what? Release them because I've released them. And their standard is, watch this now, not their behavior. The standard is that, boy, I've forgiven you. Let me ask you a question. I'm not going to ask you to boy, announce what your sin is, but how many of you all have been released by God for a heinous sin? And God is saying, if you offend a holy, righteous, just, pure God who hasn't done anything to you but only died for your sins and you sin against me, isn't it less for you to forgive somebody on a lesser level? Because they have not, for, they have not, they have not um, um, sinned against you the way you've sinned against me. Guard your heart, soften your heart, suffer well, stay sexually active. Remember the, the reason for your relationship. Forgive for goodness sake. Number seven, walk by the Spirit. How many of y'all have flesh? <laughs> How many of y'all flesh just show up at boy un, ungodly times and boy unsavory ways? He said, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Well, Pastor, what are the desires of the flesh? Turn to, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. You guys good? Galatians 5. Verse 6, says, but, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now here are the deeds of the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things do not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. Does your flesh get the best of you sometime? Walk by the spirit, not by the flesh. Number eight, do not become weary and well doing. You know what? I'm just tired of doing what's right. Why well, I always got to do what's right? Why well, I got to take the high road? Why well, I got to be loving and they low down? Why well, I got to be the one forgiving? Why well, I got to be the one who keep passing this stuff up? Why well, I got to be the one who keeps sacrificing? Why well, I got to be the one who got to be positive? Why well, I got to be the one who praying? Why well, I got to be the one who, when boy, they ain't doing nothing. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of you. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6 verse 19 you guys there hello hold on Galatians 6 hold on now I got the wrong verse I wrote it down wrong but it says do not become weary in well doing. Where's that, y'all? Somebody help me out. Where's that? I, I wrote it down wrong. Where's that? Do not become weary in well doing. Y'all there? It's in the Bible. Somebody find that boy, text it to me, all right? It's in the Bible. Watch, watch, watch it. Okay. Number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine. Y'all good? Okay, I'm sorry. Six nine. Okay, I used to be six nine. I played college basketball. I left. I'm six five now, all right? Okay, six nine. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Stick with it. Hang in there. Keep trusting God. If they don't pay you, God going to pay you. Number nine, y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? That's the song to it. Y'all ready for this? Proverbs 5.15 says, drink from your own cistern. Hello. My wife and I, bro, we were driving to Arkansas years ago. And but we were driving down the road and but I looked over to the right. And I saw this cow, his head was stuck in the, in, in the little wire gate. And boy, I looked and boy, his head was stuck because he was trying to get to the grass that, that boy, appeared to be greener on the other side. And now this cow has risked his life trying to get what appeared to be greener on the other side. 
God says, drink from your own cistern. We good? Am I keeping it too real for y'all? Number 10, watch this now. Obey God, trust God's wisdom over your own wisdom. Y'all good? Y'all good? So, boy, well, boy, God got to agree with me. I got all this evidence against them, and so, boy, surely God agreed with me, and surely God see it my way. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Don't trust in your own heart, especially when you're mad. Don't trust in your own heart, especially when you're hurt. Don't trust in your own thoughts, your own ideology, your own strategy when you're trying to navigate pain and struggle. Amen? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not, what? Sound but all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. All right, y'all say, Pastor, that ain't good enough for me. Okay, number 11, these are the two bonus ones. Keep your covenant. Well, boy, I didn't know he was going to do all that. I didn't know she was going to do all that. I didn't know it was going to be like that. I didn't know it was going to be broke, no lights, no heat, no working car. I didn't know it was going to be like that. that Mama always over here, grandkids over there, uncles and nephews always coming to visit and borrow money. I didn't know it was going to be like that. Maybe God didn't tell you because you wouldn't have did it. Watch this now. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they are doing, that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your sin and do not say before the messenger that it was, hello, a mistake. Have you ever said this was a mistake? I knew I shouldn't have married you when you wore that green silk shirt with Jerry Carroll juice on the collar. I knew mean, that should have been an indicator she was the right one for me. God says, do not say it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. Guys, red light, yellow light, green light. Do I stay in the relationship? Do I leave the relationship? Guys, I have not read about irreconcilable differences in the text. I hadn't read about we just can't get along. I have not read, we just don't like each other no more. I haven't read, you know what? This ain't what I thought it was going to be. He does give you two exceptions, adultery and abandonment. But watch this now. Even in those two, those are not commands. Those are concessions. Keep your covenant with God. And then lastly, number 12. When you're trying to navigate suffering and marriage, you're trying to navigate and avoid divorce, you know, listen to strong believers. Hello? My mic's still on. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walk with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. This is just my own personal survey and evaluation. It seems to me that when people get divorced in general, not always, it seems to be their friends get divorced too. 
and now it's, it's kind of like the friends are now hanging out together and they're spending time together and they're enjoying each other. You very rarely see somebody who get divorced who most of the people they're hanging out with got strong marriages. Hello? Who are you listening to when you struggle? Who are you listening to when you try to navigate pain and anger and bitterness and, and confusion and disaster and discouragement and depression and exhaustion and frustration and, 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 and boy, you've been getting, who are you listening to? Are we tracking together? Don't go to a person who currently wrestling with alcoholism about advice on how to stay sober. Now, if they've beat it, and they living victoriously. And they got some distance between when they was an alcoholic and whatever. Okay, you can listen to them. But somebody who smell like alcohol and got a bottle in their head and said, boy, you shouldn't be. I ain't getting drunk. I'm just getting a nip. Don't listen to them. They're dangerous. Who are you listening to? The Bible says that bad communication corrupts good morals. Psalm 1 says, um, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his word does he meditate day and night. You know what we do? We get angry, we get bitter, we get frustrated, and we play will of fortune. And we spin the wheel, and we spin the dial, and we call people until they tell us exactly what we want to hear. So I'm not suggesting that life isn't challenging. I'm not suggesting that marriage can't be disappointing. I know firsthand, boy, how to cause pain in a marriage relationship. But the question becomes, do you know how to navigate the pain? Before you choose a red light, yellow light, or green light, have you gone to God's word? In fact, before you get to this point, why don't you start putting out the fire before it rages too large? So often we wait until it's a full-blown five-alarm fire before we try to go extinguish it. Let's hit the fire early on. Let's hit it before it becomes a major issue. Let's put it out with a fire extinguisher before we need to call the fire department. Let's pray. So, Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. And God, most of us who've been married thought about the red light, the yellow light, and the green light. And God, many of us, God, who are in a marriage relationship, we face some of the same issues, people who've chosen to exit the relationship. So I want to pray, God, that, Lord, you give us your capacity I want to pray, God, you give us your mindset. I want to pray, God, we remember the purpose of marriage. I want to pray, God, that we don't take an exit apart from your wisdom, apart from your exceptions, God. And I pray, God, that you would empower us to be all you call us to be. God, this COVID season has caused for a lot of marriages to come to an end. But the reality is, God, you can, you can restore. I know people, God, who've gotten married again, and they're happily married now. So I want to pray, God, that you work in the hearts of people, God, today, Father. And God, I've tried to make this palatable. This is a challenging topic. And I want to pray, God, for those who are struggling in their marriages today. I want to pray, God, that you show up and show out, Father. I want to pray, God, that you do the miracle that's necessary, Father, to restore relationships. My mentor, Dr. Tony Evans, says that, God, when a marriage relationship is not working among Christians, that means one or both of them are not walking in the Spirit. So I want to pray today, God, that we ask ourselves, are we consistently walking in the Spirit? I want to pray, God, we stop looking at our mates first I want to pray God we look at ourselves and say you know what am I consistently walking in the spirit of God you're the almighty God you parted red seas you gave sight to the blind surely you can give life to lifeless marriages 
I pray, God, for those who are contemplating marriage. I pray, God, they don't marry an unbeliever. I pray, God, they don't marry a spiritually immature person, Father. I pray, God, they marry according to your wisdom and according to your way. It's in Jesus' name I pronounce it all. Amen.